Great. Okay. It's good to see you all this morning. Thank you for coming. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, especially because um, I, st I speak at a number of conferences, and it's really great to speak at a conference in Australia where I don't have to travel long distances for. But I suspect some of you have traveled long distances, so I want to have some um, audience participation right at the beginning. Um, uh, can you please um, put your hands up if you've traveled here from outside um, Australia? Anybody? Oh, most of you. That's great. Um, can you leave your hand up if you've come from Europe? Okay, can you leave your hand up if you are from the Azores? Nobody, okay. So it turns out the Azores are directly opposite from Sydney. If you, if you drilled uh, through the earth, you would pop out in the Azores in the middle of the Atlantic. And this is about as far away as you can get uh, from Sydney. And as I was preparing this talk, I thought about travel. And one reason why is because about uh, three weeks ago, I went to um, Japan for a meeting. And um, actually two meetings, I, I flew to Japan, spent uh, five days in Japan, and I had two 10-minute uh, presentations while I was there. And it seemed that it was a big waste of time to go um, all that distance just for two presentations. And some of you have traveled, you know, maybe not from the Azores, but certainly from uh, France or Germany or other places in Europe, all the way around the world to come um, for this uh, conference. And so um, why, why do we do that? Well, one reason is because people really like to uh, communicate and connect with each other. And so there's this really great quote from John Pierce saying that communication is not in the essence of being human, but also it's a vital property of life. And of course, uh, over the, the, the centuries, we've developed technology for um, helping us communicate, you know, from um, uh, the pictures on clay tablets all the way to the modern communications we have. In fact, one of the big innovations happened um, 150 years ago, when, um, 140 years ago, when um, um, Alexander Graham Bell developed uh, the first, uh, one of the first phone telephones and made the first um, long distance uh, phone call. And so it was amazing, because now you could communicate with people that weren't in sight and, and almost instantly. And around that time, uh, people started imagining uh, new ways to use this newfangled technology. So here's a, a magazine article that came out 20 years later in the Strand magazine called The Pleasure Telephone, and, and it talked about different ways that you could use the telephone. So, you know, for children's lectures, for listening in the courtroom, for concerts, and, and so forth. But, in fact, in that article, oh, by the way, at, at the end of the presentation, I will give you a, a, an email, and if you want all these slides, just email me and I'll send you all the slides. So that will save you from taking pictures because you can get better resolution. And with the videos as well. So, Anyway, so in this article, um, the person quoted there imagined even a, a more fantastic future. And he said, so Arthur Strand in the article said that um, if the principle of sight is applied to the telephone as well as that of sound, the earth will be in truth a paradise and distance will lose its enchantment by being abolished altogether. So he imagined not only having a phone, but some magic technology that would let you send pictures. And sure enough, 50 years later, we had that. So this is the, the video phone, and let me play the picture here. Technicians make last minute adjustments for the world's first demonstration of the telephone of tomorrow at the Western Electronics Convention in San Francisco. It's the often forecast video phone. How does it work? Just lift the receiver and you see your own image. This feature's for the girls. At long last, a reason for the primping that usually precedes a woman's phone call. No picture is transmitted over the line, though, since no call is placed. Then dial your number, just as with an obsolete old 55 model phone. And when your party answers, there he is, almost as big as life on the 10-inch video screen. The system could have its disadvantages as well. So that was 60 years ago, and of course since that time people have been developing the technology more. This is um, the latest Cisco telepresence system, and one of the goals is, is to produce an environment that is as close as possible as being there. So we don't have to fly from England or France to Australia, you could use technology like this to remotely attend meetings um, like this. And in fact there's a company in Australia called Being There that does video conferencing as one of their slogans. And of course we've had many, many different iterations of technology since then. So you've got a variety of video conferencing, you mobile robots with video conferencing equipment on them, handheld devices and so forth. Um, but it turns out current technology like this has a number of limitations. So for example, um, there's a lack of spatial cues. When you see somebody on a screen, they kind of blend with the background. Um, you have kind of poor communication cues. Looking at somebody on a small phone screen that isn't the same as, as you know, you can't see their hands anymore so they can't show you hand gestures and so forth. And there's also this disconnect between the physical and digital world. So when we have the people looking at the monitor here, 
um, what's on the screen there is kind of the communication space, but there's a physical space in front of people where oftentimes they do, um, uh, they're, they're writing on papers or sharing objects, and the people on the remote end can't um, interact with that, so there's this kind of disconnect. But in science fiction movies, we see other ways of communicating, and um, the, so here's, here's Star Wars and, and um, the Kingsmen. And in this case, they're, they're using augmented reality for teleconferencing. So in the Kingsmen, you put these little glasses on, and all the empty seats around you fill up with people, and now you have this natural blend of the physical and virtual world and very rich communication cues. So you know, if you really want to make that uh, a fact, and if Optus or some um, telecommunications company want to make that for real, then you need to you know, have display technology, some sort of tracking technology, a way to capture people and as, as volumetric um, images, and super high networking so you can send all that big data um, across the network. And it turns out, um, at least in my research field, I've been working on this um, a lot, and others as well. And so you know, in, in 1989, in 1999, sorry, we, we developed um, an early AR video conferencing system. A few, ten years later, we had a volumetric um, system, and then around the same time, actually, not, that's 2003, not 2000, yeah, that's 2003, 2008, CNN showed something similar, and Microsoft um, 2016 had this live volumetric system. So let me show you a little bit of videos. This is one of the first systems we built where you could look through a head mount display, and he's um, putting Lego blicks together. And uh, Lego is sometimes hard, so in our version of the Lego, you can look at the um, tracking image here, and you can see an animation of the, dis of the Lego coming together. But he's having a hard time, so he's going to call the Lego helpline, and then this lady will help him. And so she appears um, out of this marker, and then um, you know he can start conferencing with her. And to some extent, it appears like she's in the real world. There's no physical screen, and, and she's life-size, and she's right in front of him. Um, also, we can take the camera from his view and share back to her so she can see what he's seeing and have some shit, shit experience. So that was almost 20 years ago. And then a few years ago, Mi Mi Microsoft developed the holoportation. And this system, you can use uh, multiple uh, depth cameras to capture people in live uh, 3D, metri 3D uh, volume and then sh share that remotely. So you can see on the, the screen there, um, the reconstruction of um, Sharam Azadi in real time. And when he puts the head mount display on, he can see his remote collaborator in front of him. And like our system, which is flat, this is now a 3D um, volume. But, um, and, and you know, we can look at, see, are we really there yet? So we indeed have um, displays like these ones, like the music displays here that look like a pair of glasses. We've got relatively good tracking. Um, there's capture systems. So this company, Mimesis, which was bought by Magic Leap, half a year ago, they do a 3D metric, volumetric tracking and they can sit and send you to remote places. Um, and there's, of course, um, um, gigabit per second networking and, and 5G is just coming as well. So if you look at the scorecard, we're kind of getting there in terms of um, some of those pieces. So you might say that we're getting to the point where we can go beyond, we can go to be, to be um, if you like, being there. But 20 years ago, there's a really great paper written called Beyond Being There. And in this paper, Jim Holland said that actually what you want to do with video conferencing is not recreate what happens in the real world because you'll never do that because there's always going to be, you know, even if I'm looking at somebody on a screen, the fidelity is not going to be exactly the same as what happens in the real world. What you should be thinking about, though, is not being there but going beyond being there and looking at how you can combine communications and computing to create radical new types of teleconferencing. So with this AR technology and VR, we shouldn't be necessarily just trying to reproduce what we have here. You know, I don't want to put glasses on and see you all sitting there like the Kingsmen. I should be thinking about what I can do that I can't do in the real world, and that brings a true value to, um, to remote collaboration. And in this case, he was talking about uh, video conferencing and how that could be enhanced. Uh, for example, a simple way of enhancing it would be to be, have some system that automatically captures the whole collaboration and, and does speech uh, to text and indexes everything that's said and so you never again forget what happens in a meeting, which you can't do in face-to-face. -face. But we can do similar things with uh, augmented reality, so that's what I'll talk about um, today. So, for example, with augmented reality, you can do things like um, changing your body scale, putting yourself inside somebody else's body, interacting with virtual content, capturing or replaying a conference, um, sharing your space with other people, making multiple copies of yourself, um, and maybe sharing enhanced communication cues. And all of these things could be combined together to create a very new type of video conferencing or tele-presence experience, which we don't have today. So I'll show you through some of those. 
and you can see how that might be applied. So this is one of the systems we developed in our lab. Um, it's fairly standard. We just have a person wearing a AR head mount display, and on their head is a depth um, sensor. And then they live stream the video to a remote person. So the remote person can see what they're seeing, but the remote person can also um, draw on what they're seeing and share the annotations back. So this gives the ability for somebody else to put annotations in my view. So you can see here on the um, right side is the remote person's view. He's drawing around that little character. On the left side in the head map display, I can see his annotation appearing um, on that um, character. So that's pretty standard. There are a number of commercial applications that do just the same thing. And one of the limitations with this type of technology is that, um, the, of course, the remote person can only see where I'm pointing my head because I've only got a camera on my head. So, um, and, and we have limited communication cues. And so we went beyond that and we looked at how we could add, combine together several pieces of technology. So um, we, in this case, we combined eye tracking with the AR display with a special pair of glasses that can measure your face expression. And the reason for doing this was to try and share some of the communication cues that we have in face-to-face -face communication. So if you're smiling, I can tell, I can kind of tell where you're looking and so forth. And so we, we combine all this together, um, and so this interface here shows um, the heart rate of the person using the system, a little um, an icon to show what face expression they have. And the most importantly is this green and red dot. So the green dot is the annotation from the remote person who can point at things. And the red dot is the eye gaze from the person who's um, looking at this. So this is really important because when you wear a camera on your head, typically you want to get a very wide field of view camera so you can see a lot of um, your workspace, or a remote person can see a lot of your workspace. But if you do that, then um, you now don't know exactly where the person's looking because you've got a very wide view. So with our system, you will now share that gaze cue, and that provides a very important implicit communication cue. People always look at things before they interact with them, so if we have that gaze track, we know what somebody's about to do. Oops, and there should be a video there. Oh, looks like I left it off. That's not good. Sorry about that. Let me just um, find... I was too efficient with my slide editing. Um, so I can find it really quick. I'd hate for you not to see that. Okay. So this is the video. And what you can see here is two people working together. Um, the person uh, on, on the on the right hand side here is arranging bricks or blocks in front of him. This person has a remote view and he can now move his mouse point around. And he can tell when the other person is paying attention to him because the eye gaze pointer will follow the mouse pointer. So he knows when he's paying attention or not. Now, this is a pretty simple application, just building pictures out of blocks. But you can imagine, for example, if it was like a bomb disposal application, and the person had to cut the wires on the bomb, and you know, by looking at where he's looking, I would know immediately if he's about to cut the wrong wire, because he'd look at that wire here. Yeah. And we also have this technology for measuring face expression, so we, we used um, retroreflective um, sensor that can measure the distance to the skin, and it turns out when you make face expressions, your, your muscles change the distance to the skin as well. So we can tell where you're smiling or not. Um, so he's assembling these things there. So as I said before, the most important thing was that this um, enabled you to um, share implicit communication cues. And what we found by doing that was that people found a higher sense of social presence and connectivity. But again, one of the limitations of this is, is um, that you can still only see where the person's looking. So in a... Oh, there we go. There we go. So, sorry. In an updated version of the software, we added um, a 360 camera on the person's head, and so we can now stream a 360 view to a remote person. So this person here is inside a VR headset. We have a live 360 view to him, so now he can look wherever he wants because he's got a 360 camera. Um, one of the challenges now is we have to know where the other person's looking, so we have these squares appearing that tell you where the other person's looking. And also on the VR headset, we had a leap motion, so you can track their hand gestures. So when you put your hands in front of your face, the person in augmented reality will see these ghost hands floating in front of them, and they can then use that to help them interact in the real world. So this is a video of this working. Um, so you'll see here a person in a um, power station wearing Microsoft HoloLens and a, um, a um, R360 camera. And then um, this is what they're seeing inside their headset. And 
uh, the hand gestures from the remote person uh, appearing in front of them as these ghost hands, and now they can make annotations of point, and those annotations appear fixed in space in the real world. So it becomes a very natural way to collaborate um, together. And then this is the person inside VR. Uh, we have the uh, live stream video, and so when the person in the VR looks around, they feel like they're standing in, in, in the same real environment as the person in AR. And they can um, see what they're seeing, and they can look around independently. And because it's a live video, if things are happening in the real environment, then that gets updated as, as well. So they can quickly use hand gestures to look around. Now, of course, one of the limitations with this is that we're um, sharing 360 video, so the person inside the VR can't really walk around because it's just a video. Um, so what we're doing now is looking at how we can live capture the scene. So we imagine that sometime in the next few years you have to have a small handheld device, you can walk into a room, click a button, and you can start live streaming 3D geometry from that space to a remote person. And then the remote person can then walk through the space and feel like they're really there. So we developed an early prototype of that. We, we've got a cluster of um, RGBD um, sensors, so depth um, sensors, and we have written some software that fused together the point clouds from each of these into a single point cloud, and, that, um, and then we can view that inside a VR in environment. So for example, with the example I just showed you in the power station, we could have some sort of device like this we put in, in the power station. We can live stream 3D geometry to a remote, remote person, and they can walk around independent of the person who's in the real world. So this is a video of that working. How did that jump forward? Here we go. Um, so what you'll see in this video before I play it is on the right-hand side, is the, um, the VR environment. And this is a live um, stream 3D environment. On the left hand side, there's somebody in the um, Magic Leap display who's looking um, at a real table with real objects. And the person in VR is telling him which objects to move and how to move them. So you'll see, um, they're gonna pick up this yellow object. So you'll see a um, virtual hand appear. It'll point to the yellow object. Then you'll see a real hand move the yellow object and they'll move it around another place and you'll see the real hand appearing in here actually. So this shows how you can use the VR and AR to collaborate uh, together. So you can see there's the virtual hand saying move this object here and then you'll see a um, person put the real hand, that object disappears and then they can place it over there on the yellow arrow and you can then see the object appearing back into the VR environment. Um, so in, in this case we've got multiple cameras um, uh, outside the table facing in, but we can also, so that's an outside in um, scene capture, we can also go inside out, and the next video shows that. So what you have here is, um, this is the top down view, this is the first person view, we've got some depth sensors on the ceiling of our office, we can capture that in real time, and you'll see in a second, um, so this is the person in VR looking at their hands, here's a person in the real world walking into the office, and so we can see them as a, as a point cloud appearing, and um, and then the person in VR can walk around and follow them um, in the um, real uh, or in the virtual environment. Now, obviously, this is quite crude. So you can see the table, which is supposed to be flat, has kind of got a wave in it. There's lots of blue there. The blue is where you've got uh, occlusion, so you can't see behind those objects with a depth sensor. But you can see it's got some potential. And 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 using this um, type of approach, you could indeed develop a system where you could real-time capture the real environment and then live stream that to a remote um, person. Um, and so that will enable you to do applications like this, where you've got a person um, setting up a sensor in, in one environment, doing some real world task, the remote person is trying to help them in that task and they can now walk, walk through a 3D reconstruction of that environment rather than having to look at it on, on video. So we've got, got this evolution from um, 2D um, sh view sharing to 360 <coughs> to now 3D, which has an increased immersion and better scene understanding and also better uh, collaboration. But of course, in Jim Holland's paper, he talked about going beyond being there, and in many cases, in many ways, this is kind of like being there, because you know, now I feel like I'm sharing the um, real environment with the person. So there's ways you can use AR to go beyond being there, a much, much um, more detailed way. So one way um, is how you can use AR and VR to show um, some communication cues. So in this case, we've got an AR-VR collaboration going on, but um, what we're doing here is, um, on the right-hand side, you can see a, a view for us from coming out from each person's faces. So normally in the real world, I can only see where you're looking if I look at your face. And, and, and if, if, you know, if, if you're um, behind me, I can't see where you're looking anymore. But in this case, with the view frustrum, oops, do that. With the view frustrum, um, you can see where I'm looking. So I'll show you a video of that working. So we, again, we've made a digital copy of our real lab space. 
This is the. Wow, I was doing that for. Okay, so. Sorry about this. Um, so in this case, we have a person in AR, and when you look at them in AR, you will um, see these lines coming out of their face, which is the view frustrum. So if I'm in the real world wearing my AR display, if I look beside me, I'll see a virtual head floating beside me, which is the remote person who's collaborating with me. So there's um, the AR view, and um, you can see the view frustrum because I'm looking at that person's face. And then um, we're looking around. This is the VR copy of the real environment. And now uh, the person is behind me, but I can still see this pink pyramid appearing, and that tells me where they're looking. And so in this, and then now their head appears in this task. I can collaborate with somebody and more effectively, even when they're out of sight. So we're using the AR to provide and, and VR to provide a communication cue that we don't normally have in the, in the real world. The other thing you can do is, um, once you've got a copy of the real world, um, you can change your body scale. So you can make yourself really big or really small. So you can imagine, for example, if you had a, if you were a fire chief and you had to coordinate a firefighting operation and you had 10 firefighters going into a building and you had our technology to remote capture the building and share it, you might want to make yourself really big so you can see all the firefighters really small walking around the building and you have a kind of a God's eye view to, to guide them around. So we can do that with, with VR and AR. We can change our body scale either up or, or down. So in this video here, you see that. So it's the same kind of setup, an AR VR setup here. The person is hitting um, buttons on a um, menu to drop um, objects in space. And now they can change their body scale. So now they made themselves really big. And so the person in VR has become really huge. The person in AR is still the same size, but I see a little head down uh, below me. So, so the VR person feels like they're a giant looking down at this small person. And then in a second, they'll change their body scale back down to be um, really uh, small. And, um, so you know, maybe in that way they could explore the space in a different way than if they were face to face. So now they're the same body scale, and now they're going to they're go to one tenth the size. And um, so now they're really small. If they look up in the sky, they can see the big person in, in the real world looking down at them, and they, are, and they can now go around it in the uh, virtual environment, different body scale. One of the other things you can do, so in a um, in face to face communication, again, I can only see some of your communication cues if I can see your body. You know, if, if you're making hand gestures or gazing or moving your body around, I can only see it if I can see your body. Um, but inside VR and AR, there's no need um, for me to own if you only if you only have one uh, body. So in this case, the Mini Me project, what we did, um, you can see on the left hand side, we've got two people collaborating together. Um, this is supposed to simulate an AR VR situation, so they're, they're life size avatars. In this case here, um, one of the people is looking at this um, cupboard, and the person is behind them pointing at a location on the cupboard. So, of course, the person can no longer see that person's virtual body. And so, what we did in this case is we create a miniature copy of the person and put it in front of you so you can still see their body and what they're doing with their hand gestures and their body gestures. So, that's why it's called a mini me. And so it lets you share communication cues even when you're out of sight. So um, I'll fast forward this a little bit. But, um, so one of the issues with things like the HoloLens is they have a limited field of view. So that means that oftentimes the person you're working with is no longer in your field of view anymore because it's a small field of view. But with the, with the, um, with the Mini-Me, they can always be in the field of view. So I'll play the video. So the basic idea is that when you look at the person um, and you see a life-size avatar, like here, that's great. But then if I turn away, then um, you'll see a miniature copy of the person appear. So there's a miniature copy right there. And the miniature copy of the person will also point at the same location in the real world and do the same body gestures. So there's a person pointing at this cube, and the real person is actually actually behind me. So you can see here the person's behind me pointing at this object, and I see the little miniature guy pointing at the same object um, as, as well. So again, this is another example of using AR to share communication cues in a way that you can't do in the real world. You know, we don't carry miniature copies of ourselves around and send them out to show um, what we're doing. And then um, uh, one of the other experiments is I was looking at how we could, let me just fall this a little bit, is once you've got a miniature version of the remote person, then you, know, you, you could be kind of this giant person and you could m move them around and, and point them at objects you want, you want them to see. So we have this project called On the Shoulder of Giants. And so you can see a person in VR, and they have um, this handheld uh, controller that is tracked, and the avatar of the remote person appears on the controller. Then I can turn the controller around to point the person at what I'm interested in looking at. Um, so you can see that in this video here. 
So there's the person in VR. This is the um, um, AR person. Um, oh, sorry, it's the other round. This is the VR person who is, and this is the AR person here. Um, the person in VR has a live 360 view from the um, from the uh, perspective of the handheld device, so they can see around. So they can see now that kind of collaborate on fixing um, a PC. And so he's asking her to move him so he can see inside the PC. And now he's able to point with his controller, and she can see the little miniature gestures helping him. But um, and you see when when if you've got good eyes, you can see on the handheld device she's holding, there's a little pyramid appearing. And that's his view for us, Trim. And we've actually texture mapped a live video on the face of that so she can see um, what he's seeing as, as well. And so you can drag the remote person around and you can um, um, now know exactly what they're looking at um, as well. So those are um, a, a number of different um, experiments showing how we can use AR to move um, beyond just uh, being there. So as I said at the beginning of the talk, there was a lot of um, emphasis in, in video conferencing, and there still is in, in providing video conferencing or teleconferencing technology that allows us to feel like we are sitting across a real person and communicating with them in the same way. And there, there's a lot of efforts in that area still with AR. Um, yesterday, um, when we had the talk in the, in the boat, um, uh, she was showing some pictures of using uh, Magic Leap for teleconferencing again, and, and life-size avatars are appearing in the real world. But we can do more, more than that, and so what I've shown you so far is how we can use the technology to enable us to change our body scale, to capture the real world, to make annotations on the real world, to drag people around, and so forth. So where might this all be going? Um, so there's a number of different technology trends which I think most of you are familiar with. So uh, of course we've got um, a lot of display technology trends where we've got um, much more advanced displays with high field of view. We've got technology that can do real-time um, space capture and scene scanning, like I've shown you already. Um, we've got more natural gesture interaction, and we saw this day last night also um, with Magic Leap doing some really great work on, on natural hand tracking. Um, there's also eye tracking as well. And most recently, we've started to see uh, VR and AR displays that start having um, physiological sensors in them so they can measure your um, emotion. So for example, here's a number of displays that are on the market that combine um, EEG or EMG to measure your uh, face muscle activity or your brain activity. Um, so, and, and then you can use the data from this to make inferences about people's um, cognitive state or um, emotional state. So in, in our most recent work, we're looking at how we can use this to again provide an enhanced um, collaborative experience. And um, one of the interesting um, areas of research is this question here. Now, can my thoughts influence your thoughts in some way? Um, almost like ESP or something like that. So um, it turns out that over the last decade, people have started to um, study um, brain activity of several people at the same time. And this has uh, been called hyperscanning. And the idea is you have two people doing some task, and you measure the brain activity from both people, and then you see if those activity levels um, synchronize up. So here's some typical setups. Um, if you're very, very rich, you can afford to buy an FRMI machine. So there's an experiment with two FRMI machines connected together between Pasadena and Houston. Um, if you're moderately rich, you can buy FNIR's system that uses infrared to measure brain activity. So here's a picture of two people with FNIR's system on their head, um, uh, looking at monitors and measuring their brain at the same time. And if you're more poor like we are, you have to use uh, EEG equipment, so these are on the bottom right or left is two people with EEG setups, and then you measure the brain activity as well. So it turns out when you measure that brain activity, you can in particular look for the, uh, the phase of the brain waves. So there's um, a, a couple of signals on top there, and then you um, convert that through signal processing to uh, phases, and you can see where the pink color is this is where the signal is not in phase, and where the green color is, this is where the signal is um, in phase. And so to give an example of that, here's um, two uh, violins playing the same piece of music, and you can see if you measure the brain activation, you can see the heat maps of their brains are quite similar. So because they're playing the same piece of music, thinking about the same piece of music, um, keeping time, then the, um, the EEG signals relatively similar. And in this next video clip you'll see two violinists playing very different pieces of music and 
So now you, you will see their brain activation patterns are very, very different. So this is a very new area of research for EEG. It's only been studied in about the last 10 years or so. And um, what people have observed is that when you get this brain synchronization happening, then people report that they um, are, are feeling this improved uh, feeling of a sense of flow. So it's the psychological state where you kind of lose track of time. Um, you have better collaborative performance, um, increased uh, social presence and trust. And there was even one experiment where people had a classroom of students and they all measured uh, their brain activity over a semester while they took the class and they found that the students whose brains synchronized with each other um, got better grades than the students who didn't because they were able to collaborate or connect better with those students. So there's many benefits that come from this. So in our research, um, so people have studied this for a number of, uh, for a long time, in, well 10 years in face-to-face, in, -face, in real world interactions. In our research, we want to look at how we can um, explore this in virtual reality. And one of the classic experiments people do is a finger tracking experiment. So you can see two people here wearing EEG equipment. They've got their fingers out, and then one person will start moving their hand around, and the second person will trace uh, or follow the finger with their hand as well. Um, so you basically have them um, still, and then you, you um, have them alternate being leader and follower, moving their hands around and tracking, and then you have them being still um, again. And it turns out when you do that, interesting things happen. So this is the, um, the brain activity of one pair um, before they start the um, experiment. The black dots there are the EEG recordings on, on their head. And then you have a heat map that shows the brain activation. So this is right before. This is um, while they're doing the experiment. So while they're moving the fingers around. Um, you can see a couple of loops there. These loops show that um, those two electrodes are in phase with each other. And then when they stop moving, so remember that before they started moving it was like this. When they stop moving, we observe something like this. So now, even though they're not moving anymore, there's a lot of connections going between each of the participants. And this shows that there's some um, synchronization uh, happening. So we've been able to reproduce um, the results of um, people who have done a number of experiments face to face. Um, this is the kind of setup we have. But what we want to do is, is do this inside VR. So um, of course, when people are wearing the, um, the, the, the EG hardware <coughs> and the, the VR headsets, they no longer need to look at each other. So in the VR environment, you can put the headset on and you can look across and see the other avatar of the other person and then you can track your fingers and do the same experiment. So this is what it looks like. So there's the person in VR and um, they've got one hand out each and they're trying to track um, the opposite person and then they move the finger around. Um, but of course with VR you can do things that are more interesting. So what we want to do in this case is put both people inside the same virtual body and the theory is that when you're inside the same virtual body, because you're getting the same perceptual cues of the other person, that may even increase the brain synchronization even, even more. So this is what that would look like. So now you've got, you look down and you see four hands coming out of your body, two of yours and two of your friends. And then as, uh, as, sorry? Oh, that's okay. Um, as, as, the friend, as the person moves their hand around, then um, the other person um, can follow as well. And this is very new research, so we, we just got some results this week actually. So what we found, um, first of all, this is um, in the face-to-face -face situation. Um, I apologize just for having numbers and not anything more beautiful like a graph or anything. But um, in the brain, there's different types of brain waves, alpha, beta, delta, gamma, and theta. And what we're seeing in this case is um, um, in the face-to-face, -face, in the real world, there's an increase in synchronization in the beta and theta frequencies, you can see the um, numbers go from 170 to 210 before and after the experiment, and that's significant um, using um, chi testing. And then we have people inside VR, and we're finding something a little bit different. So in the VR case, face to face, there's some synchronization happening, but only in the alpha band, whereas in the beta band, when we have the same perspective, we get that synchronization happening again. Um, so we need to study this more, but what we think is happening is that in, in VR, um, the VR experience has a lower fidelity than the real face-to-face -face experience. You, you, you can't see the subtle micro-expressions on the person's face, and, and the person across you doesn't look like a real person. So that may affect some what's happening. Um, and in, in the, the beta case, or sorry, in the, in the shared viewpoint case, you no longer can see the other person, but you can still see the environment. So because you've got the same perspective, that may allow that brain synchronization still to happen. But we're still exploring that, so we'll have to see.
And then ne next week, I should pause this for a second. Some of you, I think, are going up to Brisbane to see the um, uh, Seagraph Asia conference. And if you're going to Brisbane, then you can try this out for yourself. So next week we have this experience, which is called hyperdrumming. And the idea is you can sit across the table from somebody else in, in VR, and you wear a headset with um, EEG electrodes, and you do a drumming task. Um, and you have some uh, real uh, um, a drum um, sticks. And as you tap on real objects, you'll hear some beats in your ear. But the goal is to try and synchronize with the other person, not only um, with the music, but also with the brain activity. And as you do that, you start seeing more visual cues playing and more um, enhanced um, audio um, effects as well. So this is a teaser for those of you going to Brisbane. So, um, of course, this is motivated because in the real world, um, drumming has been a way for people to connect together. And it's a very uh, easy way to get rhythmic um, synchronization going. So we've got drumming setup. So this is our this is our early experiment with the brain signal synchronization I talked you about. Um, and then um, we're using that same algorithm to process the live data from you as you just drumming experience. And with our experience, we, we've developed it so you can use any objects you want to drum on. So they're using some cups and saucers here. <laughs> Um, and then you put the headset on and you start drumming and um, you can't hear what they're hearing but in the, in the headsets they can hear the beats um, from the um, real objects and then also you can start seeing some visual cues that give feedback in terms of how synchronized you are in, in your brain synchronization. So come um, next week to Brisbane and you can try this out for yourself. So just to wrap up, um, I want to give a few conclusions. So, um, in general, in my opinion, in terms of communication trends, there's kind of three things that are happening. So, so one is improved content uh, capture. So, we've gone from you know being able to do Skype calls to be able to have technology that to capture and share our spaces. So, I showed some examples of 360 video and now scene capture. There's also an increased network bandwidth. You know, when I first started using computers, we had 56, or actually 28, 2400 board modems, and now my apartment in Auckland has a gigabit fiber connection to the apartment, so it's crazy fast network networking. And then we've got an, an implicit understanding. So we've got technology that can recognize our behaviors and our emotions. Now with our mobile phones, we can hit the button and talk to Siri, and Siri does a pretty good job of recognizing our speech. And then we've got cameras that can recognize our faces and other things like that. So all these three things are coming together to create opportunities for new types of collaboration. And that overlap space is, is what we're calling empathic computing, and that's where the focus of my research lab is, is building technology like I showed you that can help us develop new experiences, especially experiences that enable us to share what we're seeing, hearing, and especially feeling with others. So things like the hyperscanning I showed you give you some insight into the person's brain activity that you're communicating with and help you hopefully give you some idea of what they're feeling as well. But where might that be going? Well, we can combine all these things together um, and the trend is what you might call towards empathic uh, tele-existence, which basically means that people move from being um, remote observers to being participants with each other. So here's some screen shapes not from the, um, the TV series Black Mirror, and they've kind of projected forward maybe nightmare scenarios of this, but it enables us new types of communication from going from explicit communication to telling what, what person what to do or to implicit communication where you can watch what they're doing together and more experiential collaboration where people can do things um, together. And one outcome from that might be things like this empathic tele-existence. So a, a, a while ago, let me just turn this off here, there was this really bad movie called Surrogates that came out um, 10 years ago with Bruce Willis. And the premise of the movie was that sometime in the future, you'd be able to buy relatively inexpensive robots. And then the robots will walk around the real world and you can experience the real world through cameras in their eyes and through microphones. And you can be at home in your VR environment doing things you wouldn't normally do in the real world, like jumping out of buildings or um, you know, doing very dangerous activities. So, in this movie, um, okay, so, they, so here's the robots being built. And then they're walking around the real world. This is Bruce Willis going to the VR environment. And then you'll see Bruce Willis in the surrogate. And in this case, you can tell he's because he's got hair in this one. So, he, whereas in the VR, he's got no hair, of course. They're walking around, the and then this guy's jumping off the building that would normally kill him, but he's Without just fine. Risk or danger to yourself. And um, we are confronted with 
and then the premise of the movie is that you know it's really great, but then and there's been no um, murder for a long time in the real world because people can't be killed because they're all robots. But then suddenly some of the robots start getting killed, and for some reason the VR people connected to them, the real people, start dying as well. So Bruce Willis has to solve this um, this murder mystery both in in VR and in, in, the, in the real world. So that might seem like some sort of um, mythological fantasy, but actually you can buy that today, and you can do it today. So here's a promotional video from a Japanese company called Tally Existence, and um, he's um, opening up his box, putting on the VR gear, and um, then he's um, going into VR and he's visiting a surf shop. He puts the VR headset on, and this is the robot. So um, the robot's kind of humanoid shaped, it's got cameras for eyes, microphones, it's got hands, and it has touch sensors in the fingers, so it can reach out and touch things. So he's talking to the um, surf shop guy, and he's going to feel the surfboard and send the touch of the surfboard remotely back to the guy over here. So that's something on the market today. It's about $100,000 to buy one of those. <laughs> but um, I think their business model isn't so much buying them as more like renting time on them. So he's got a son now, and his son wants to go somewhere. So they decide, oh, well, we'll make a quick trip to Kyoto, and we can look at the Cherry Blossom Festival. And now they go to Kyoto, and they both jump into robots that are already in Kyoto and can walk around and you pay 20 bucks an hour or whatever, and you can experience this remote location. So maybe in five years or 10 years' time when we have VRST, when I look out to the audience, there'll be a bunch of robots sitting there rather than real people, and we can inter and you can stay home and not have to travel 25 hours um, all the way across the world to um, Australia. So just to wrap up, I I've shown you a number of different things today. I guess the overall theme is that, you know, in the room here, you're developing some amazing technology, and we can use that technology to go beyond being there. Rather than just trying to reproduce video conferencing experiences or remote collaboration experiences, we can look at ways we can move beyond that. But there's plenty of opportunities for new research. So uh, there's many, many different directions. So in our research, we're looking at how we can capture and share emotion. And there's a lot of research on how to do that, or it needs to be done how to do that, and how to represent emotion to other people. There's lots of research that can be done on, on novel interaction, on how to, to scale this type of technology up to support hundreds or thousands of users on um, being able to measure the impact of uh, social presence and also being able to measure the acceptance. You know, do people really want to be able to have virtual people in real meetings with them or robots walking around talking to them as well and lots of applications as well. So thank you for the time for speaking. Um, this is my contact details. If you email me, I'll send you a link to download the presentation so you can get all the videos and everything as well. And I think we've got some time for questions now. Great. I'm sure people can just shout out and use their inside voices or outside voices and I can hear them. Good luck. Right. Okay, good luck. Okay, thank you. Mark. Yes. Great, great, great topic. Very inspiring, actually. Um, I was interested in, uh, you mentioned on the um, Facebook page that you experience we're doing here, the people are in the same room, but they can't see each other, of course, because, they, because they've got, so, so um, I, I'm not sure if that, that will have a mirror neuron effect if you can't see the other person. But I know that um, in some of the hyperscanning studies they've done, they've looked at what happens when people do the same task when they can and can't see the other person. So for example, they just sit side by side, and between them they put a barrier, so then they look at a, a screen, and they do a task like um, a tracking task, where I, I move an object with my mouse, and you have to move your mouse the same way. And they've looked at what happens when you can and cannot um, perceive the other person. And when you can't see the other person, then the, the amount of um, brain synchronization drops significantly. So there's something about being able to see the micro expressions of the other person. And so I think that's in, in the results I showed you. And these are very, very early results, so it's very crude. But I think that's why in, in our um, VR case, we're not getting that synchronization in the beta and theta bands because our avatars are very, very crude. But the great thing with the VR is you can experiment with that. So we can make, you know, maybe when we are face-to-face -face with somebody, maybe it's the eyes that make the connection. And so we can have very photorealistic avatars, but we can take the eyes away. 
or maybe it's the whole face, or maybe it's some other piece. So we can now um, use VR to explore the phenomenon more. Yeah. 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 Rick. Uh, thank you. Um, seeing how things are going, there's a lot of work being done in terms of trying to get humans more like natural emotion, you said in the last slide, natural communicating natural emotion. It feels that feels like that the humans themselves tend to be a little bit more of, they're really a high bandwidth when it comes to emotion and nonverbal cues, but they're pretty ambiguous still and there's a lot of issues in collaboration simply because we're not that great at interpreting emotion. Uh, if you look, like this is a little bit of a crystal ball question, but if you look 20 years down the line, do you think we're still going to do human avatars? Because it feels like if we are actually better at detecting emotions, if we're better at detecting states than we might even be ourselves, we might want to move away completely from human avatars and do a more effective way of communicating emotion. And so are you meaning that instead of having a human avatar that shows emotion or smiling or whatever, there's some sort of abstract or other avatar that shows emotions in different ways that it's more easy for me to perceive. Yeah, exactly. So, so ba basically if I have somebody that I'm collaborating with and that person is really agitated right. and we can see that on the EAG, we can see that in all our measurements, but if I were to see that avatar, I there would be a lot more ambiguity with regards to me interpreting that. So it would might be better to us actually to communicate that in a different way. I want a sign above their head saying agitation level 100 yeah. or something. Yeah, basically. So, so, yeah, so, so take so, away yeah, the human. So, um, so we've done a little bit of work in that area, but we need to do more. One piece of work we're doing now is um, enhanced um, expression. So the idea is you have um, a person sitting at a monitor, a monitor who's doing a um, desktop collaboration in, in VR, and then you have the avatar in VR but we can um, artificially enhance the emotions that um, they're showing. So if they're smiling a little bit in the real world, the avatar is smiling really big. Or if they're showing a little bit of annoyance, the avatar sh looks really angry. So we can artificially enhance their face. So it's, it's not um, exactly what you're saying in terms of um, being able to use non-facial expression, but we can um, um, make it their face expression more obvious. And this actually might be very interesting across cultures. So in some cultures, um, traditionally don't show emotion very much. You know, the, the stereotype is that people from Japan are kind of stoic and they m don't so show much emotion and people from Italy go crazy and wave their hands and everything like this. So so when you have an Italian talking to a Japanese person then of course this is, this is a bad stereotype but they, they may have difficulty communicating because the, the person can't understand. So now if we have some magic way to communicate the Japanese person's emotion in a way that the Italian person relates to, then you can get there. So, so we're, we're starting doing baby steps in that area, but it, it may be, like you said, that we don't even want to communicate emotion using face expression. We might used to have some other methods. Um, there was a, a research done at MIT Media Lab where they looked at changing avatars' uh, body representation depending on their emotion. So that you'd have these bodies, and when you got angry, you'd have spikes coming out of your body. And when you were happy, your body was kind of round and uh, fluffy and they changed, and so it made it very easy for you to understand how that person was feeling, because you could sort of look at their body and see if they were spiky or if they were fluffy, so, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thanks for an inspiring talk. Oh, thank um, you. Uh, I, I was wondering if you had given some thought to the, uh, I'm sure you have, but, but I'd like to hear those thoughts, uh, on the indirect consequences of, of some of these technologies. Uh, yes. Uh, in, in particular, I was thinking about the telepresence, uh, and, and one reason why telepresence might not work for conferences such as this one is that, that if, if, if Robot Mark was, was talking to ro robot audience, yeah. then the robot would probably be frozen much of the time, because if we were not somewhere else, we would be, or if we were someone else in reality, we would be, have all of these other in commitments that we would right. need to attend to. Right, sure. And I think that, that, that somehow a physical conference is a commitment device. Right. And it was just just thinking whether you had sort of these social consequences or, or complications, uh, what are your thoughts on, on those? I think that's a really insightful question um, and it's quite hard to predict what the con consequences can be. So you're right, conferences are commitment devices, although I dare say that in the room here there's probably half a dozen of you right now that are looking at your phone or on Facebook and not paying attention to what's happening um, or on email or whatever else and, and the technology we have today allows us to multitask and divide our attention between different things. But I think it's very difficult to predict what the um, impact of technology um, might be. So for example, um, 
uh, when I, about 20 years ago I was in the airport and I saw this man and he was talking very loudly to himself and I thought he was crazy and then I got closer to him and he had a Bluetooth headset in his ear and it was the first time I'd seen that but I realized he was talking on the um, a microphone to somebody remote obviously and but you know, up until that time that type of behavior would have associated with a crazy person but but now you know if you see people walking around with the, the you know, rectangle of glass in their hand talking or waving you, you know what they're kind of doing so um, it's really hard to predict what the social consequences of some of what I'm talking about here will be I'm sure there's going to be positive and I'm sure there'll be a lot of negative consequences um, as well you know in the surrogates world um, people um, don't go out very much, so they all become very unhealthy and fat, and they just stay at home. and, and Their ability to interact with other people in a face to face environment is, is severely diminished. Um, so, you can measure positive and negatives, but uh, I think that's also a, a very fantastic area to work in terms of some of the sociology as well. One of the things that I'm really looking forward to is the ability to be able to capture and replay communication and I'm becoming very forgetful now so if I can have a meeting with somebody and somehow capture that experience um, then I won't forget ever again and I can remember you know what we talked about 15 years ago or, or replay the experience or maybe when people have died you can talk to somebody who's passed on uh, or um, interact with them again in some way as well so our notion of communication I think will change a lot but it's hard for me to predict exactly so Is a question. I just want to follow up on exactly this replacement of experiences, right? So we saw Holland's demo as good as it was for, for telepresence. <clears throat> but when we talked to them about possibility to store that that whole experience, they were talking about gigabytes of data per second because there was a, so much geometry. Yeah, yeah huge maps. So, yeah. Yeah, so what would you reckon can happen there? We do we need some kind of new formats for storing this or well, I'm, I'm pretty lazy, so I'm just hoping that, you know, right now it's not unheard of that you could have a terabyte of data in your um, USB stick, right? And of course, um, we've all seen the pictures of 30 years ago, people wheeling big fridge size 5 megabyte drives onto planes, things like that. So um, um, I think that within the next 10 years it won't be, very, won't, won't be difficult for us to have a little USB stick or 10G or whatever it's going to be that will allow us to capture and stream right away. But there will be need for new formats and and, and it's very inefficient. What we're doing right now is we're just creating a point cloud and just storing it all and that's very, very inefficient. So um, there are other people, not our group, but other groups looking at semantic understanding and they talked uh, a little bit yesterday about that for Magic Leap. So if we're capturing a room, we shouldn't necessarily have to capture all the points. We should be able to recognize what the chairs are, what the tables are, whatever else, and then just share the semantic description of the room to the remote person without showing everything. And it's the same with me as an avatar. Once I've had my body scanned, and as long as I don't gain or lose dramatic amounts of weight, then I could share the key features to the remote person, and that could be a relatively small amount of information, and that would still allow me to have me animate at the remote end and look like um, a, a, a photorealistic avatar. So there are ways to have very small amounts of data traffic, but um, as I said, I think the um, amount of data storage capacity is significantly increasing compared to the processing capacity, and so maybe it's not going to be a problem anymore. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We have time for our last question. And I'll be around all today, so if you're shy, you can catch me all today. And then tomorrow I'm going to Seagraph Asia, and like I said, if some of you are going to Seagraph, you can see some demonstrations. We'll have, we have two, actually, or well, three demonstrations, actually. So we'll, we'll show um, Tio's work he gave a presentation about yesterday. We'll show the hyperdrumming, and we'll also give an example of our 3D person capture, which you can see as well, so you can try for yourself. Okay, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you.